station. This is the American Geophysical Union. How do you hear me? Station, uh, we hear you loud and clear. Welcome aboard. Thank you, and good afternoon, Station. And on behalf of our AGU members worldwide, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Our first question is for Andre. Andre, before launching to the station in November, you said that working aboard the International Space Station is like, quote, standing with our toes in an ocean that's still to be discovered. Can you tell us more about what you meant by that and how your perspective has changed over these last six months? Well, uh, the, first of all, the perspective didn't really change. I, I still think uh, that uh, there is so much more to discover. Um, what I meant with standing with our toes in the water, uh, I don't know of, from whom the original quote was, is that uh, we're, we're only at the beginning of uh, of discovery uh, discovery of the universe. Uh, it's like like the whole ocean that is there to to, uh, to uh, discover, and you're only standing with your toes in the water. So you still have to go with your feet, your legs, and uh, all the way to uh, to great depths, and uh, we do we will do the same thing uh, with the universe. And uh, I, uh, I I'm I'm very privileged that I can be part of this first uh, little step into the water. Joe, your background includes geology, hydrology, environmental education work with the Peace Corps, and teaching middle school science and math. Can you tell us how your space flights have affected your perspective on the importance of science education? Yeah, when you uh, when you come up to space and you look back at the Earth, it's a uh, it's just a beautiful sight, and you have a chance to for the first time really to look at the big picture. And a lot of what we do in geology is we look at small pieces and try to build together a bigger map. And so from space we get to see that, and you get to see the atmosphere. You see how uh, different parts of the Earth interact with each other, and so the importance of protecting the planet is very, very evident from space, and so I'm really glad to see that. And when I get back and I go talk to students in the classroom, it's really easy now to give them my perspective and to show them pictures to show how fragile the planet is and how much we need to do to protect it. Don, you've shot some amazing videos and photos during your three missions in space. Have you perceived the changes to the Earth over that time? And what have you seen that has surprised you? What uh, well, one uh, change that I've seen over Earth is the uh, the number of lights, city lights at nighttime, particularly over South America. Uh, in 2002, 2003, uh, uh, it was d uh, pretty dark, and now it's uh, amazing how lit up it is. So, so human beings are expanding, and and we are advancing with our technology. And electricity is part of that technology. So it's it's a natural flow for human beings to expand and uh, and in the process turn on their lights. Uh, that's that's one of uh, w one effect that I've seen uh, uh, from uh, uh, this mission compared to my first mission. This is a question for any of you. We're expecting a solar maximum next year when the sun will be very active. What do you do and what is it like to be on the space station during a major and potentially dangerous solar event? Well, one consequence of solar max is that it inflates the atmosphere and, and it actually gets, uh, gets uh, uh, extends up to a higher uh, altitude and and I think it actually protects space station a little bit more so so uh, so so that's one aspect of a solar max uh, another aspect is uh, we could get some outstanding displays of Aurora and there will be particle events uh, e eruption solar proton events uh, that can uh, can uh, increase the the radiation that astronauts would receive in a low earth orbit scenario this is another question for any of you. By now, you have all spent significant time in space and have hopefully had a lot of time to observe the Earth. Now, when you look out the window, can you differentiate among landmark geological features on the Earth? For example, can you tell the Rockies from the Alps? Yes, absolutely. Uh, sometimes I'm uh, surprised uh, that uh, I just look out the window, even at night sometimes, and uh, I, I recognize the, the area. Uh, 
Sometimes it's it's the colors. Uh, Australia is very distinct uh, from, for example, uh, Sahara. Sometimes you you see a feature and you know that you're over uh, Tibet. Uh, so it, it, you learn the earth uh, very well up here. And uh, and, and 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 well, I would say 80-90 percent of the time uh, uh, I'm more or less right uh, of where we are. Uh, with the announcement yesterday that China's Shenzhou 9 spacecraft docked with the Tiangong 1 Space Lab module, what do you think about China's plans to construct its own space station? Uh, well, before they launched, there were six people in space, and there's seven billion people on Earth, so we're like one in a billion. Now there are nine people in space, and if you're a good engineer or scientist looking at that, you'd say, well, that's like two in a billion. So, so the gradient of human beings going into space is moving in the right direction. We, we need to change these numbers so that more and more human beings can call space their home, and we can expand off of planet Earth and move out into our solar system. So this is a step in the right direction, and the more uh, entities working on trying to achieve this, the better uh, the results will be. Don, since you still have the microphone, tell us, during your pre-flight interview, you said that adventures, like living in space, teach you lessons that can be used back home. What lessons have you learned on the station that will you, you will use back on Earth? Uh, well, one whimsical uh, uh, answer would be never pass up a chance to eat a pouch of mashed potatoes. And, and, of course, that could be oriented towards uh, my family when uh, we're eating at the dinner table. Uh, but uh, lessons, you learn lessons about yourself. You learn lessons about humanity in general. And you learn lessons in science about how things move and operate around you. And, and you take these lessons back with you. And uh, another example is just... Uh, the conservation of angular momentum. Uh, I, I saw one of my vitamin tablets floating across the room, and it was tumbling end over end, and it hit the wall, and it stopped tumbling end over end, but moved off at a much faster speed than, it, than its center of uh, mass was moving at the time it hit the wall. So it exchanged angular momentum for linear momentum. And you see uh, textbook, you read about these things in textbooks, but then you get to see them here. And that imprints your mind. And then when I go back uh, to Earth and I start doing engineering, that little tidbit is going to be stuck in my mind. And who knows where it might surface for or some new kind of uh, invention. And this is another question for Don, but I'd be curious to hear all of your answers. Don, your June 11th blog post was a poem that included the line, your last day on Earth, what would you do? It makes us think of a bigger picture. Tell us what you think about during the quiet moments on the station or when you're looking out the window. What are the questions that you contemplate? Well, uh, funny you should mention that because uh, uh, I, I, I did write that poem, uh, Your Last Day on Earth, and I'm writing the compliment poem because we are uh, a week away from returning, and, and uh, the title of this one is Last Day in Space. And it's not done yet, so you'll just have to wait and, and see how it turns out. I don't even know how it's going to turn out. Well, it's pretty nice when you can uh, sit up in the cupola and you can get the node nice and dark. The other crewmates are off doing something else and you have a chance to look back at the Earth. And you do think about how fortunate we are to have this opportunity. We're very, very lucky to be here. It's an honor and a privilege. And it just makes you think about how beautiful our planet is and how much more we have to learn and all of the exciting times that are ahead of us. So it, it's great to be here. And I envy those kids that are out there now for the adventures that they're going to have in the future. Every time when I look out of the window, it looks like the first time. Every time it's it's so magnificent that I think that this is awesome. And I try to, to keep that uh, moment. And what we can do, we can take our, our pictures. Uh, and I try to 
to keep it in uh, in my mind. Um, this is probably the last time that uh, the last week that I'm up here, uh, and it's a it's a fantastic planet, but also very fragile. I wish everybody could could see this and realize that it's one planet uh, with with limited resources, beautiful uh, but fragile. And I think this is one of the most important things that uh, that I can uh, bring back home. Thank you all very much for your time and wonderful answers. And on behalf of all the AGU, Andre and Dom, we wish you a safe trip home on the first. Uh, thanks for coming aboard. And uh, we'll look forward to ta uh, talking with you folks after we return. A station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the American Geophysical Union part of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from Fox Business News. Hi, NASA, can you hear me? Hey, NASA, can okay. you hear us? Uh, Fox News uh, Station, we can hear you. Great, can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. So the recent success of private space companies such as SpaceX changing the way mankind looks at space flight. We've talked a lot about it on the Fox Business Network, and it also changes the way staples such as the International Space Station operate. Joining us now, Expedition 31 flight engineers, NASA astronauts uh, Joe Akaba, Don Pettit is also there, as well as Andre Kuypers, who's um, from the European Space Agency, native of the Netherlands. Good to see all of you guys, and welcome to everybody watching us live on NASA TV today. But uh, it's great to get a chance to talk, and as I've said, we have talked a lot about this story story of private companies taking over for governments, doing what you do. I'll start with Joe, but I want everybody to answer it in succession. Uh, Don and Andre, pick right up on it. What's the difference been in working with private companies, and what do you think it means for the future of uh, space exploration? Well, it's been a, a pleasure working with SpaceX on their first mission to the International Space Station. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a great step in the right direction. It means a lot for where we're going in the future. If we can have private organizations helping us get to low Earth orbit to do the science that we're doing here, it really frees NASA up to do some bigger and greater things further away from Earth. So I think it's a great step in the right direction. And I think in, in spaceflight, it's not much different than uh, what we have seen, of course, uh, on Earth, be it in, in, uh, in, in shipping or, uh, of course, in aviation. And the first steps, the, the difficult steps, the investments are done by governments and then companies take over. And uh, the, the same thing will happen in, uh, in spaceflight, uh, be it uh, cargo transportation or uh, tourism. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it's a natural process. And private companies don't uh, can't seem to be able to do things in a little more relaxed nature, just in terms of of uh, uh, looking at their their mission control and 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 how how they are are conducting themselves. It it, uh, it it's interesting to note the difference between the NASA mission control and the the SpaceX mission control, just as an example. Yeah, let me stick with uh, Don because I know you guys are passing along the microphone there and, and ask the following question because there were a number of interesting observations that I heard from all three of you there that there weren't huge differences, but it was more, as Don said, more relaxed uh, compared to what we've seen um, in the past. Uh, so with that, let me get to the original point that was made about the science that you guys are doing up there. If someone says, hey, governments, not only the United States, but Europe and all the other governments are, are spending so much money and now private companies are spending so much money on space exploration, justify it for us. Why is it still worth it, and what are you doing that will help us here up there? 
Well, uh, yeah, you have to remember that exploring space is not just about doing science. Science is part of exploring space. Uh, exploration is a social endeavor that that a, a, a society, a government, uh, with their people decide to do, and and with that will reap long-term benefits. And history shows this. You look at the countries that did transoceanic exploration in the, the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, and, and they basically defined the map of the world at that point in time. And the same thing's going to happen with space. And, and the countries that decide to participate in exploration of space will be the same as the countries that tried to, that uh, that participated in the transoceanic exploration they will be the ones that define the meaning of this epoch in time and station houston acr that'll conclude the event